Have you found yourself overwhelmed, see no end in sight, lost your why to praise? That's why the book of Psalms is so helpful and so important. David gives thanks to the Lord, thanking him for the victory over enemies and difficulties. Well, let's look at Psalm 30, looking at verse 1. We'll look at those first five verses there today. He says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, at the dedication of his house, this was sung and this was written by David. David didn't glorify himself here, but he glorified the Lord. He said, I extol the Lord. Well, that word extol means to praise enthusiastically. It should show us that Sunday worship is not a concert or a family reunion but it should be a time where we enthusiastically and from the heart give God the praise that he's worthy of. Some might have praised David's accomplishments and even the, the palace that was built as an achievement of man, but instead it was a time for praising God. Well, for background, 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, that describes the working on King David's palace. It says, then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. And so David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. King David knew three things about his being king. He knew the Lord had established him as king over Israel. He knew that he had been called and he had been placed. Second, he knew the Lord had exalted his kingdom. And David knew that the kingdom belonged to God in the first place. It was God's kingdom. And then third, for the sake of the people of Israel. David knew God wanted to bless his people. God does bless you and I. He blesses us in order that other people might be blessed. And we must make ourselves available to lead or especially to serve when we're needed. Because our spiritual gifts and talents were given by God for his glory and also for the benefit of others. Well, it wasn't only for David's sake that he was lifted up, but for the people of Israel. And I think that's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to do good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. And I think God is also looking for righteous leadership in that case too. Well, David says, I will extol you. Why? For you have lifted me up. He knew that his kingdom was the work of God. It wasn't that David just stood by and let God do everything because we know that God, that, that, that David was a man of action. But once too many times, we know we take credit for God's actions. Well, at the same time, we should be busy in God's kingdom, being involved where God directs us, whether it's at the hours at the church house or your house or somewhere in the community. He says, I will extol you. You will have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Well, as far as David concerned, that's, that was an important part of God's victory because when you're king, you have enemies. And God protected him. Now, the apostle Paul wrote again, if God be for us, who could be against us? And then Paul also wrote in Ephesians 6, Chapter 12, when he said, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
much of which attacks our hearts and our minds. But know this, that the darkness uh, is using many people today to hate, to aggravate, aggravate and humiliate uh, the kingdom of God. And so you and I, we can be used by God as God defeats them now and ultimately as we are people of faith and of love and prayer and wisdom while we are sharing and showing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, in verse two, David is thankful for healing. He says, oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. David lived a prayerful dependence upon God. The Psalms, of course, are filled with his prayers and his praise. He says, you healed me. No doubt there were many times as David was a soldier and a king, many times of illness and injury. But we know healing can happen. And probably you know it for yourself, that healing can happen mentally and physically and spiritually. That's why we are to pray believing. And again, allow God to meet you where you're at and according to what you need. And he knows our needs before we even ask. So we keep praying, we keep believing. Many of you know God's help and rescue in a time of need. Some commentaries believe that David remembered when God saved him from a life-threatening illness. But in verse three, he gives thanks for preservation of life. He says, O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. And we know in his life as a soldier and leader that he probably had more than one time where he was near death or close to a dangerous situation. And God rescued his soul from death. He writes, you have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. One day, we, one day we know David would pass away, but there are many occasions where God delayed death, not allowing him to go down to the pit. I wonder if that's when we, what we mean when we say that God is not through with me yet. God has something for me to do. And we've got to always be watching and waiting with anticipation for God's calling and God's directing. You may have had that praise report as well. I think he's identifying with those pit praisers that anyone can praise on the mountaintop. But some of you have lost jobs and health, lost loved ones, or you should have lost your mind and gave up and quit, but you cried on the Lord out to the Lord and he heard you and delivered you, bringing peace and even comforted you through the Holy Spirit who would say, let not your heart be troubled. And now you have a praise on your heart and a praise on your lips. The Christian believer knows that death too has been swallowed up in victory. And, and we say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, in the fourth verse, he encourages us to praise. He says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. As the body of Christ, we should be like David here. The awesome work of God didn't only cause David to praise, but he was also compelled to have others praise with him and to join with him. I think that's one reason why we meet together and love to meet together to worship God and give him the worship that he deserves. But what a great thing it is when we come together as a corporate body and sing together and worship together. It would be appropriate because they were saints of his, his special people, people set apart from others to be his people. What would happen if we were to behave that way, if we were to think that way, if we were to worship that way? Spurgeon, the great preacher, said David felt that he could not praise God enough himself. Therefore, he would enlist the heart of others. Our praise should be contagious and letting the whole world know what, who God is and what he's done for us. Giving thanks is another way of praising God for his goodness. As someone gives you a, uh, some help or a gift, uh, we should be appreciative. You, you can imagine, and some of you probably know, the hurt that comes when someone is unthankful for the gift. Can you imagine the rudeness and the awkwardness of ingratitude towards God? There's more reason to praise him in verse 5. It says, For his anger is but for a moment, 
His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but here's a good word. Joy comes in the morning. David calls God's people to praise, and then he gives them reason for it. Here we rejoice that the anger of God is real but momentary, while his favor, his acceptance, and his pleasure is for life. Here is a contrast between the momentary period of God's anger with his people and his lasting favor that he holds them in. I believe there are things that we can do that we can say and we can think that would make God upset and maybe make him angry. One time he got angry and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. In the New Testament conversation, we might say that his correction or discipline from God is for a moment, but his grace abides forever. And even sometimes his anger and his correction is because that of his grace and that he loves us. He, said, he takes us, as the song says, just as we are but he doesn't leave us that way. We know God is slow to anger and he is ready to save. David said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm pretty sure David said this as a testimony from his own life. There were many tearful nights. You can go through the Psalms and see that he probably had many tearful events followed by joyful mornings with the recognition that mercies of God are renewed every morning. And just because we become a Christian, it doesn't mean that there will be no trials or heartaches or sadness. We may feel like we have come to the wit's end or we, we, we've forgotten, lost our why that we worship. And there might be just not a night, but a night season. And you have sweated and cried yourself to sleep for many nights. Know this. That somewhere between COVID-19 and combat, David says weeping may endure for the night. As in weeping may rent a motel room for a night, but he's got to check out in the morning because joy is checking in. Night and morning are contrasted as well as weeping and joy. This emphasizes the certainty of God's comfort and joy to his people because morning always follows night. And the weeping believer is confident as he keeps his focus on God that he will bring him once again to joy. This can be a similarity of sufferings and the exaltation of Christ, of the night of agonizing prayer and the morning of resurrection. It is like David said in Psalms 3, 5, and 6, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves around against me round about. Lean in again and listen to those first five verses of Psalms 30. Where he says, I will exalt you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Let's pray. Lord, we come together in this venue to praise you and to praise you enthusiastically. Even for the rest of our days, we praise you. We acknowledge, dear Lord, that you are in control. We ask for that healing mentally, physically, and most of all, spiritually. Bless those here watching right now with joy and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, if you have a favorite psalm, you can leave it there in the comments section. But thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time.